ready to discuss the decade of 1880. This is a time that is sometimes called the Gilded Age. The term Gilded Age is a term attributed to Mark Twain. And so gilding is a thin layer of gold that's applied to an object to make the object look as if it's solid gold. So the term Gilded Age describes a society comprised of a large, impoverished class of people underneath and a thin layer of wealthy gilding on top. In other words, the gilding in this analogy includes a small class of wealthy people and the capitalist industrial system that sustains their wealth. So this is an age of people who can be described as wealthy industrial capitalists. For example, Andrew Carnegie, he made a fortune with his company Carnegie Steel. On the screen, you see a picture of Andrew Carnegie, and I believe it's a picture of Carnegie and his wife. And also at the top of the screen is a picture of one of Carnegie's steel plants. Uh, another person, John D. Rockefeller, he made a fortune with his company Standard Oil. These men are sometimes called robber barons. These are people who controlled much of the nation's wealth. And they created monopolies using, well, rather cruel, ruthless, and deceptive tactics, doing things that would actually be illegal today. For example, Rockefeller, so he established a monopoly for selling oil in the United States. And note, on the one hand, this was before the invention of automobiles, uh, so this wasn't oil for cars or gas, but the oil was still quite valuable. Uh, it was used for many things at this time, such as fuel for kerosene lamps. So what Rockefeller did, he secretly had control of companies that sold supplies for the oil business, and he had control of companies that provided transportation for the oil business. So that meant Rockefeller could demand that a small business owner sell his company to Rockefeller. And if the business owner refused to comply, Rockefeller would manipulate things so that the business owner suddenly faced inflated costs for everything, for supplies and for shipping. So, for example, the cost of oil drums would suddenly go up. And consequently, the small business owner was forced to either sell to Rockefeller or go bankrupt. Uh, on the screen, the picture on the lower left-hand corner is a political cartoon depicting Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company, uh, showing it as an, a large octopus that's taking over the United States. So during this era, during the decade of the 1880s, it's a time when wealth disparities became more extreme than they had been previously in the United States. Now, building on this new industrial capitalism, the decade of the 1880s was also a time of impressive engineering accomplishments. The technology of skyscrapers was developed. So now previously, buildings had to be supported by their walls. And this meant that tall buildings had to have thick walls without windows. The taller the building, the thicker the wall needed to be to support the weight of the building. But skyscrapers, they were buildings supported by a steel frame construction. And the steel frame supported the weight of the building, not the walls. This meant that buildings could be taller and they could have more windows. The picture on the screen is a building in Chicago that's supposed to be the very first skyscraper built using this new steel frame construction. Notably, this picture must have been taken several years after it was constructed because as you can see, there are cars in the picture and they would not have been invented yet. And it looks like there's a surrounding building, building that's actually taller than the one in the picture. So anyway, with, with steel being used for things like skyscrapers and Carnegie Steel holding a monopoly on steel production, at this t uh, point in time, the United States becomes the top producer of iron and steel in the world. Another impressive engineering accomplishment was the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883. The pictures on the screen are from the time of its construction, and the bridge was supported by thick steel cables, 
and the two towers were set on foundations that were placed below the water's surface and below a layer of sediment at the bottom of the river. To do this, they made huge watertight boxes that were the size of the foundation they needed to dig. And these boxes were called caissons, and they lowered these caissons into the river over the spot that they needed to uh, dig out for the foundation. Then an air pump forced air into the caisson to help keep the water out while workers went inside the caissons to dig out the foundation. Now, because air was pumped into the caissons, this created rather high air pressure inside of the caisson. So when workers came out, they would sometimes experience decompression sickness. That is, that's the same problem that divers experience if they dive deep and then ascend to the surface too fast. But at this time, they didn't really understand what was happening or why these workers were becoming sick, and they called it caisson's disease. So that's the Brooklyn Bridge, another impressive engineering accomplishment. It was also during the decade of the 1880s that the United States implemented its first anti-immigration law. Specifically, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 prohibited all immigration of Chinese laborers. Now, recall that Chinese people began immigrating to California during the gold rush, and recall that railroad companies primarily used Chinese men as a source of cheap labor to build the railroads on the western half of the continent. So there was this growing population of Chinese immigrants in California and in the western territories, and these immigrants were often willing to take low-paying jobs. As a result, the white people in the West, and especially in California, they felt threatened by the immigrants, and they became hostile towards Chinese people. Maybe Chinese culture and language seemed strange and alien to white people. And the, the primary complaint that white people had was that because Chinese people are willing to work for extreme, extremely low pay, they are taking jobs and leaving white people out of work. So Chinese people were often portrayed as being ugly and dirty and subhuman. Uh, one example of this is on the screen. It's a, a political cartoon from 1878. So as you can see on the left, it depicts uh, a group of Chinese men. Uh, they look kind of like subhuman animals are crowded together. If you look closely, you can tell they're smoking opium and they're actually eating rats. And then on the right hand side, there's a white working man who's returning home to his family. And then as it notes on the screen, the, pic the caption for this picture reads a picture for employers, why they can live on 40 cents a day, referring to the Chinese men and they can't referring to the white family. So the Chinese Exclusion Act can be viewed as the first law in the United States that is designed to limit immigration. In this case, it entirely prohibits immigration of people from China, from China of laborers from China. And, and of course, this legislation is driven by people's fears that this undesirable immigrant population would corrupt the United States. Now let's go back to Europe and see what is happening in Prussia at this time. Recall that Prussia is the country that consolidated control of the German states, and they just won a war with France. It's the country that today we would call Germany, and it's the place where Wilhelm Wundt conducted his research that started the new discipline of academic psychology. So, in 1888, Wilhelm II becomes the German emperor. Uh, notably, Wilhelm is also a grandson of Britain's Queen Victoria, because at this point in history, the European nobility from different countries often intermarried. And so a lot of the nobility from different countries were actually all related to each other. Now, Wilhelm II is often described as being rather, well, immature, narcissistic, authoritarian, and insecure. He hid a birth defect that he had that is his left arm, I believe, was misshapen or maybe six inches short 
and I believe of limited mobility. Anyway, he almost always dressed in military uniforms. And when his military engaged in war games to practice and rehearse maneuvers, uh, he wanted to play along too. And when he played, his side always had to win. Sometimes he engaged in rather adolescent-like practical jokes. He's known for doing things like slapping people on the bottom, shaking hands overly hard with sharp rings, poking people in the ribs, pulling ears, and teasing people for physical oddities. He also sometimes would invite people to join him on his yacht, and then he would require them to turn out for morning exercises on his yacht. And then as they exercised, he would sometimes sneak up from behind and push them over. He also required his military leaders uh, to sometimes, he, he had them uh, entertain him, uh, and he wanted them to cross-dress and put on women's clothing and perform comedy routines for him. He's someone who often changed his opinions, but always insisted he was right. He was also emotionally somewhat unstable, as you might imagine. He could have a violent temper, but also he had several episodes where he, he had episodes of despair, where he talked about abdicating and suicide. So taken together, what this means is that a rising powerful country in Europe, Prussia, is now under the control of someone who is rather narcissistic and immature. And this will have consequences as our story continues. As now the waves are crashing, splash on a rocky Now let's go from Prussia to Britain and pick up on the story of Francis Galton. Recall that I proposed two foundations for academic psychology. One foundation was the German tradition developing in Prussia where Wilhelm II had just become emperor. And we talked about how Wilhelm Wundt conducted his first psychology research study there in 1879. And then the other foundation was the English tradition, and we talked about how the first psychologist from this tradition could be considered Francis Galton. And where we last left Galton, he had published his book on hereditary genius, and he was interested in individual differences, and he was proposing ideas that intelligence is, in, is entirely inherited and not something that is shaped or changed by life experience. So, so what was Galton doing in the decade of 1880? Now, notably, Galton is somewhat unique in our story because he never formally held any academic position. This is because he was independently wealthy and he never had to work. He just did what he wanted to do. So what did he want to do? Well, he wanted to study and investigate things. And he actually had very broad interests. Uh, so he developed weather maps and he recognized the uniqueness of fingerprints. Uh, he invented an early teletype machine. He uh, developed periscopes and he developed uh, some kind of underwater spectacles to be used by divers. So now a key event in our story is that in 1884, Galton opened something that he called his anthropometric laboratory. And a picture of that laboratory is depicted on the screen. So at his anthropometric laboratory, Galton conducted, uh, he, he conducted studies and he collected an immense amount of data on individual differences. And he measured things like people's head sizes and arm span and strength and rate of movement and visual acuity, and lung capacity, and reaction times, and auditory acuity, 
Now, recall that Gal Galton was influenced by Darwin's theory, and he was actually Darwin's cousin, and recall that he was interested in individual differences, and he believed that some people had more adaptive traits than others, and he thought some people were superior to others or more intelligent than, than others. So the purpose of this anthropometric laboratory was to measure these individual differences. He seems to have presumed that some of the traits he was measuring in his anthropometric laboratory pertain to aspects of superiority and intelligence. He was measuring things that he thought might be adaptive traits. Notably, one thing that actually is quite interesting about Galton's approach, uh, and maybe this could be called a rather clever thing he did, uh, but uh, for recruiting participants, he actually charged a fee for people to get measured in his anthropometric laboratory. And as it turned out, many people wanted to get measured with the fancy new scientific equipment he had. So Galton both obtained large data sets and he made money at the same time. So now consider the contrast between, between Galton and Wundt. So on one hand, Galton studied individual differences and he used large samples of participants that were drawn from the community. In contrast, Wundt studied processes that were presumed to be common to all people and Wundt used a, a very small number of participants, and all of Wundt's participants were highly trained experts. Galton is also important for our story because he started something that would grow like an invasive plague on the new academic discipline of psychology. He started something that would lead to a new distinctive type of racism in the academic world. Specifically, Galton proposed the idea of eugenics. The word eugenics essentially means well-born. The idea of eugenics is this. It presumes that some people are superior to others, that superior people have more adaptive traits, and that humans are evolving over time to become more and more of a superior species. And it assumes that we can essentially help evolution along if we encourage superior people to mate and to have babies, and if we discourage inferior people from having babies. So today we can see how terrible of an idea this is, because how do you determine who is superior? In looking back, it's clearly evident that people who were defined as superior were the ones who tended to look just exactly like the people proposing the theory of eugenics. And as we will see, Galton's theory of eugenics became an extremely popular academic theory that was used to support racist views. In the United States, it was also used to support sterilization laws, segregation, and immigration quotas. And then eventually, Hitler would use eugenics to provide a rationale for killing Jewish people during World War II. And although we can look back now and see the tragedy of this theory, at the time when Galton proposed eugenics, most academics did not recognize the problems. And as we will see, eugenics was widely adopted and supported by most psychologists at this time. Now, the person who may have been most directly influenced by Galton's work and his anthropometric laboratory was the person depicted here, Carl Pearson. And Pearson would eventually go on to become essentially Galton's protege. So Pearson attended universities in both England and Germany. He studied many topics, including mathematics and physics and political science. And notably, Pearson may have had somewhat progressive views, at least in some areas, for this point in time. Uh, one thing is that he changed the spelling of his name from Karl with a C to Karl with a K to honor Karl Marx. Also, at one point, he organized a discussion club that included both men and women. And this was somewhat of an unusual and maybe controversial mixing of the genders at this time in history. So, what was Pearson doing during the decade of the 1880s? 
Well, in 1884, Pearson became the chair of mathematics at University College London. And the picture on your screen is a picture of what that campus looked like around this point in time. And while he was there, Pearson began his close collaboration with Galton. Then in 1897, he took over running Galton's anthropometric laboratory. Now, Pearson is especially important in our story because he invented some key statistical formulas. This is relevant because if psychology was to become an empirical science based on data collection, then there needed to be, there needed to be some way to analyze the data. And at this point in time, the options for data analysis were extremely limited. Researchers could count things or report percentages or averages, but not much else. And this made the process of interpreting results rather subjective and arbitrary. If you're just given a number or a percentage, how do you decide if that number actually supports a hypothesis? How do you decide if that number represents a big effect or a small effect? There were no clear criteria for evaluating results, so interpretation could be easily swayed by a researcher's bias, and this made it difficult to draw valid conclusions from research. Now, recall that Galton had previously proposed several statistical ideas, such as dispersion and regression and correlation. So, now, where Galton proposed the ideas, Pearson developed the actual mathematical formulas for calculating these things. Notably, the formulas that Pearson developed are the ones we still use today. So, for example, he developed a theory that if you collect scores from a large number of people taking one of the tests at the anthropometric laboratory, the distribution of all those scores can be described using four parameters, which were the mean, the standard deviation, the skew, which is the extent to which the distribution is symmetrical, and the kurtosis, which is the flatness or steepness of the distribution curve. Um, so he developed formulas for calculating each of those parameters. And then actually later in 1896, Pearson developed the formulas that we use today for calculating a correlation and for calculating regression. So Pearson developed some very important statistical formulas. Now let's return to our story of Stanley Hall. Where we left him last, Hall had completed a PhD at Harvard with William James, and then he did a postdoc with Wundt in Germany. And he was with Wundt in Germany when Wundt conducted his first psychology research study. So now, after spending some time with Wundt, Hall returns to the United States and he becomes the very first person in the United States to, well, to do many things, actually. So, we already saw that Stanley Hall was the first person in the United States to get a PhD from Harvard, and he was the first person from the United States to study with Wundt. And now, Hall will go on to rack up a rather long list of several other things that he will be the first at doing. So, let's see, so after returning to the United States, Hall got a job at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. So, notably, at this time, Johns Hopkins University was a brand new university, uh, and it was part of a new movement in the United States of universities that focused on providing graduate education. Uh, there was a man named John Hopkins, and he was a wealthy man that left a large sum of money in his will, uh, and the money was designated to be used to found a new university. And he didn't give any other instructions, so after he died, a board was formed, and they decided to focus the new school on graduate research. So, 
Stanley Hall gets a job at the brand new Johns Hopkins University, and shortly after arriving in 1883, Stanley Hall establishes what is typically regarded as the very first psychology research lab in the United States. So he gets a room, he outfits it with equipment, and we now have in the United States the very first psychology research lab. And that's what is depicted here on your screen now is a picture of Stanley Hall's brand new psychology research lab. If you look closely, you can see various types, of various pieces of equipment laid throughout the room. I'm not sure what all the pieces of equipment are, but if you look towards the back, I do think I see a chronoscope back there. So Stanley Hall establishes his new research lab at, at Johns Hopkins University. Now, one, one notable innovation of Johns Hopkins University was this new idea to offer paid research fellowships to graduate students to try to attract graduate students to the school. And this offer of a paid fellowship is something that will attract a person named James Cattell. Uh, James Cattell will be attracted to come and study with Hall at Johns Hopkins. And we'll be talking about Cattell shortly. Another first for Stanley Hall is that he founded the first psychology journal in the United States. It was a journal titled the American Journal of Psychology. And the story of how he started this journal is both quite interesting and it also illustrates the extent to which psychology was still a largely unknown discipline at the time. So what happened is this. There was this wealthy donor who, who heard about the new psychology that Hall was doing, and he donated money to fund the new journal. But unfortunately, this donor misunderstood what it was that Hall was doing. The donor thought that Hall was doing psychic research. Recall that spiritualism was a popular movement at the time. So the donor thought that Hall was going to publish articles on things like seances and communication with ghosts and other types of psychic phenomena. But as it turned out, Hall actually criticized spiritualism in the very first issue of the new journal. So when the, do when the donor saw this, he backed out of the agreement leaving Hall with a huge pile of debt that he had to pay off. And that's the story of the very first journal in the United States devoted to psychology. And also then, so after Hall spends a couple years at Johns Hopkins, then in 1888, Hall receives an, he receives an offer uh, to be the very first president of a brand new university called Clark University. So Clark would be another new university that's founded by a wealthy donor that's focused on graduate education. And so Hall accepts that offer and he goes from being a professor at Johns Hopkins to being the first president of Clark University. Notably, his first year at Clark University would turn out to be actually a very terrible year. Uh, the money, the funds uh, ran short. Um, they didn't have enough money to pay the faculty, and Hall, and Hall was trying to figure out how to cope with that, uh, that crisis. And then in the midst of all that, Hall caught diphtheria, and also that year his wife and child were killed in an accident. So that was a rather terrible year for Hall. Uh, and I suppose this also reminds us of the types of hardships that people often faced at this time in history. So, as I mentioned, one of the people that received a fellowship to study with Stanley Hall when Hall was still at Johns Hopkins University was a person named James McKean Cattell. And Cattell is pictured here on your screen uh, from around the time when he received that fellowship to study with Stanley Hall. In fact, I think Cattell was the very first person to receive a fellowship to study with Stanley Hall. So Cattell, he was, um, Cattell was born in Pennsylvania, and he came from an upper-class, well-educated family. His father was actually the president of a college. Uh, he was president of a college called Lafayette College. And so Cattell, eventually Cattell attended Lafayette College, and he graduated there. 
And then he went to Germany and studied in Germany for a while. And then he came back to the United States, and that's when he got that fellowship to come and work with Stanley Hall. So Cattell begins his graduate work studying with Stanley Hall at Johns Hopkins University. But things did not go too well for him there. Um, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but there was some kind of conflict between Cattell and Hall. And this resulted in Cattell losing his fellowship at the end of his very first year. So Cattell loses his fellowship and he leaves Johns Hopkins University. But then he gets an opportunity to go to Germany and study with Wilhelm Wundt. So Cattell does this and he studies with Wundt and in, in 1886, he becomes the first person from the United States to receive a doctoral degree from Wundt in Germany. So recall that although Hall was the first person to work with Wundt, Hall's doctoral degree was from Harvard, and he worked with Wundt in a postdoctoral in a postdoctoral position. So Cattell was the first person to actually get a degree from Wundt in Germany. Now, as it turns out, we can gain some insight into what type of person Cattell was because we have copies of some of the letters that he wrote to his parents while he was studying in Germany with Wilhelm Wundt. And I'm not sure how much these letters might reflect an elitist attitude of a son from an upper-class, well-educated family, or maybe they're Cattell's private thoughts that he shared with his parents, but that he did not express publicly. I'm not sure, but whatever the reason, these letters do give us an impression that Cattell may have been a little bit narcissistic, and they make me wonder if he was a rather difficult person to get along with. If so, that might explain the conflict he had with Hall. And as we will see, even though Cattell completed his doctoral degree with Wundt, he seems to have had a very low opinion of Wundt. So let me read you a few excerpts from Cattell's letters to give you a feel for the types of things he said. So here's one letter. He's writing to his parents. He starts off talking about his previous work with Stanley Hall, and then he goes on to talk about his experience with Wundt. And he says, I am getting a piece of apparatus made, which I have invented in order to carry out the work I begin in Baltimore. I have written to Dr. Hall, hinting that I would like to have my notes and papers. I am not anxious that he should publish a paper which would give him credit, which he does not deserve. If magazine editors do not see fit to print my work under my name on it, it need not be published at all. And it looks as though I have found several serious mistakes in the results published by Wundt, but of this I cannot be sure until I make some further experiments. So that's one letter. Here's another letter uh, he writes to his parents about a lecture he attended by Wundt. And he writes, Professor Wundt lectured yesterday and today on my subject. I suppose you won't consider it egotistical when I say that I know a great deal more about it than he does. But you will be surprised when I say that half the statements he made were wrong. I cannot understand how he is willing to give as positive scientific facts the results of experiments which he knows are not properly made. I could write a paper on these two lectures most damaging to Professor Wundt. It is to be hoped for his sake, as well as mine, that he passes me in the examination on philosophy. And uh, let's see, so here's another uh, where, a letter to his parents where he describes Wundt's laboratory. He says, Wundt's laboratory has a reputation much greater than it deserves. The work done in it is decidedly amateurish. Work has only been done in two departments, uh, the relation of eternal stimulus to, the, to sensation and the time of mental response. And the latter is my subject. I started working on it at Baltimore before I had read a word written by Wundt, and what I did there was decidedly original. I am quite sure that my work is worth more than all the work done by Wundt and his pupils in this department. 
And let's see what else here. So at one point, I think his parents write to Cattell, maybe expressing some concern about his relationship with Wundt, maybe saying, uh, remember what happened with Hall, let's not make that not happen with Wundt, something like that. I'm not sure what they wrote, uh, but he writes back to his parents trying to convince them that he has a good relationship with Wundt. And he talks about visiting Wundt and his wife. Uh, and he says, Mrs. Wundt is, is very nice. And Professor Wundt seems to like me and to appreciate my phenomenal genius. Uh, so he wants to convince his parents that Wundt really likes me. And then let me read one final letter to his parents. This is after he uh, finishes uh, the paper that is his dissertation. And he's writing to his parents about that paper. And he says, a paper like this gives me a very secure place in the scientific world makes me equal with any American living. One likes, however, to be given credit for what one has done, even by people who know nothing about the work. I scarcely know why we like to be praised by fools, but we do. Still, there is some reason in my case, I may want a position or a wife, and I certainly do want to be able to pick out the people I associate with. So that gives you a feel of the personality of James McKean Cattell. I tremble inside. May I understand what I clasp in my hand? A planet in need with people who bleed. Flowers today could wither away. Now I am living, so I will pray. So Cattell completes his degree with Wundt in Germany, and then after that, he does something that will have a profound influence on him. So he gets a postdoctoral position in England, and while he is there, he meets Francis Galton. So as we've seen, Cattell had some kind of conflict with Stanley Hall, and he seems to have had a very low opinion of Wilhelm Wundt. But he became enamored with Francis Galton. He really, really liked Galton's work. So as we follow Cattell and his academic career, we will see that Galton had a much stronger influence on Cattell than did Wundt. In other words, Cattell will largely become a follower of that English foundation for psychology and not really the German foundation, even though he received his doctoral degree from Wundt. Then, in 1888, after meeting Galton and becoming interested in Galton's work, Cattell returns back to the United States, and he gets his first academic job. He becomes a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and he acquires $500 from the university and $3,000 from private sources to fund a brand new psychology research lab there. This would have been a large sum of money at the time, and so this lab was probably one of the best equipped psychology labs in the United States at that time. The picture on the screen is a picture of Cattell's lab at Pennsylvania. It's a, it's a little washed out, but it looks like various pieces of equipment have been laid out for display. So anyway, at Pennsylvania, Cattell pursued a line of research that was very similar to Galton's anthropometric laboratory. Cattell introduced the term mental test to describe the types of traits he was measuring. So like Galton, he measured a wide, very wide variety of abilities. He measured things like um, rate of movement, sensation areas, amount of pressure causing pain, an ability to judge the difference between two weights, reaction times for sounds, how quickly people could name colors, an ability to identify the midpoint on a line, an ability to judge the passing of 10 seconds, the number of letters in a sequence that a person could remember. So he assessed a wide variety of things, and clearly Cattell is pursuing a line of research that looks much more like Galton than like Wundt. His approach focuses on assessing individual differences. And notably, this will be the approach that becomes most closely associated with a future intelligence testing movement and also with an interest in eugenics in the United States. Now, 
As part of this history of psychology, I want to discuss the history of a particular type of psychology that will eventually be called clinical psychology. Now, the beginning of clinical psychology is still a ways off in our story. However, at this point, I can introduce to you the person who will become the very first clinical psychologist. His name is Leitner Whitmer, and it is during this decade, or specifically in 1889, that Leitner Whitmer is just entering graduate school. And as we will see, there will be an important connection between Cattell and Whitmer. So now Whitmer was born in Philadelphia shortly after the Civil War had ended. His father was a successful wholesale pharmacist, and his family was an upper-class family that actually really valued education. Uh, Whitmer had two brothers and one sister, and all of his siblings, including his sister, eventually went to college and obtained professional careers. Uh, when Whitmer was a teenager, his parents enrolled him in the Philadelphia Episcopal Academy, which was the most prestigious school in the area. And the picture on the screen is a picture of the Episcopal, uh, Episcopal Academy from around this time. So then after that, uh, Whitmer went on and attended the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia which at the time was a relatively small school. Uh, there were only 380 all-male students in Whitmer's freshman class. And one thing that's uh, notable about his experience there as an undergraduate student is that he took classes on ethics and logic, I believe, from someone named George Fullerton. And George Fullerton was a philosopher from Princeton Theological Seminary and also from Yale. And the thing that is notable about George Fullerton is that he was well-read in the new psychology. And actually, Fullerton would eventually go on to become the fifth president of the American Psychological Association. So this means that Whitmer would have been exposed to the new psychology as an undergraduate student. So then Whitmer graduates, uh, gets his undergraduate degree in 1888, and then he began teaching at a school for young boys called the Rugby Academy. And while, while he was there, he had a memorable experience trying to help a boy who was having difficulty learning how to read. And this experience will shape the direction of Whitmer's future work in a way that will eventually lead to the beginning of clinical psychology. And here is Leitner Whitmer's graduation portrait from when he got his undergraduate degree at University of Pennsylvania. And so after graduating and working at Rugby Academy, he worked at that Rugby Academy for boys for about a year. And then he decided to return to University of Pennsylvania for graduate school. Now, recall that at this point in history, graduate schools were relatively new in the United States. And so the graduate school at University of Pennsylvania was only a few years old at this point. And so when Whitmer first entered graduate school, he was not too certain about exactly what type of career he wanted to pursue. He was considering law and business, but then eventually he settled on political science. However, this is the point where Cattell enters the story. So recall that at this time, Cattell was a brand new faculty member at University of Pennsylvania, and Cattell had a brand new, well-funded research lab, a psychology research lab. And also, Cattell had funding for an assistantship to pay one graduate student to work in his lab. Well, Whitmer had previously established connections with Fullerton, and Fullerton apparently gave Whitmer a good recommendation. And as a result, Cattell offered his only assistantship to Leitner Whitmer. Now, the only catch was that Whitmer had to switch his major from political science to psychology. And I guess the assistantship seemed like a good deal, so Whitmer gladly switched his major. And as we will see later, that decision along maybe with his experience at that Rugby Academy for Boys, set him on a course that will eventually lead to the founding of clinical psychology. <laughs>
Now let's cross the ocean back over to Europe again and look at what's going on in Paris, France, because in the decade of 1880, there were some interesting things happening there. So at that time, Jean Charcot was a famous neurologist in Paris, France, and he was probably the most famous expert on what today we would call mental disorders. Here are a couple pictures of him. Uh, you may recall that I briefly talked about Charcot previously. He was the person that Henry Bowditch studied with before Bowditch returned to Harvard and helped William James get his very first job. And so Charcot worked and taught at a psychiatric hospital for women called La Salpetriere. And incidentally, this is the same place where Peniel used moral therapy about 100 years pri prior to this point. So students came from all around the world to study with Charcot. And he was known for giving dramatic lectures and presentations. Charcot was also part of high society. He married a very wealthy woman. He had a very wealthy wife, uh, he maintained a lavish home, and he frequently had the elite of Paris society uh, to his home for, for fancy, lavish dinner parties that he threw. Now, many of the women patients that Charcot treated at La Salpetriere were given a diagnosis of hysteria. And the concept of hysteria has ancient Greek and Egyptian roots. The term means wandering uterus, and ancient people believed that hysteria was a problem that could be experienced by a woman if her uterus moved around her body. Now, in the decade of 1880, academics no longer believed that hysteria was caused by a wandering uterus, but it was an extremely common diagnosis given to women at this time in history. Now, it's a little hard to define exactly what hysteria was because hysteria could include an incredibly wide variety of symptoms. It could include things that today would be diagnosed as depression and also things that might be diagnosed as schizophrenia and also probably epilepsy. Now, many women who were diagnosed with, uh, with hysteria had somantic symptoms, that is, symptoms relating to their bodies. So, for example, their hands might be paralyzed, or they might lose feeling in their hands, or they might become mute and unable to speak, or they might become unable to hear. And these symptoms might come and go, or they might affect specific parts of the body in ways that, uh, in ways that, uh, that did not really make physiological sense. And as it turns out, Charcot took lots of pictures of his patients. And the pictures on, these, on the screen now are pictures of women at, uh, at Salpetriere who were diagnosed with hysteria. Now, a primary treatment that Charcot used to treat hysteria was hypnotism. And here is a famous picture of Charcot giving a demonstration of hypnotism at Salpetriere. Now, Charcot had a theory that he called the theory of grand hypnotism. And according to his theory, susceptibility to hysteria is caused by a deteriorated nervous system. And this deterioration also causes a susceptibility to hypnotic suggestion. So Charcot, so Charcot thought that both hysteria and hypnotism have a pure form, which he called grand hypnotism or grand hysteria. And in both cases, the grand variety was expressed in a particular sequence that included stages that he called lethargy, sombulism, and catalepsy. In other words, the key point here is that he had a theory about exactly what hysterical women do when they become hypnotized. Now, Charcot's theory, though, is based on an approach to research that had a very serious flaw. So at La Salpetriere, there was a kind of a hierarchy among patients where some patients were more favored than others by Charcot and the medical staff and the medical students. So who were these high status favored patients? Well, the favored patients were the ones that displayed the appropriate responses during Charcot's demonstrations. <laughs> 
Thus, the patients had a strong incentive to perform in ways that matched Charcot's theory. And the person who is sometimes labeled as the queen of hysterics uh, was a woman named Blanche Whitman. Uh, she was the person that Charcot used most frequently for his demonstrations, and she could be counted on to produce the stages just exactly as Charcot expected, just exactly as he wanted her to. And in the picture, you can see Charcot and Blanche Whitman. Uh, along in the picture also there is Joseph Babinski, uh, who would later discover what today we call the Babinski reflex, that is where stroking a baby's foot make, makes the baby arch its toes. And also someone named Charles Ferre. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, and we'll talk about Charles Ferre in just a moment. All of my senses, all my emotion, may they bring me closer, put me in motion to a kaleidoscope of beauty so wide. Sometimes I pause and tremble. So, as it turns out, in the decade of 1880, there were two people who were studying with Charcot in Paris, France, that would go on to become very famous people. One of these is a person that most psychologists will know, and the other is someone that just about everyone will know. So, who are these two people? Well, the first person is the person depicted here, and this is Alfred Bernay, and Alfred Bernay uh, many psychologists will recognize Binet as the person who is famous for inventing an intelligence test. And we will say more about his intelligence test later, but in the decade of 1880, Binet was studying with Charcot in Paris, France. And while he was there, he made a major blunder. So anyway, so Binet, he is, well, he's actually uh, another one of these uh, wealthy men that inherited his money and never had to work to earn a living. Uh, we seem to have a lot of those in this story. And so uh, he spent uh, some time studying law and he studied medicine, but he eventually abandoned both and he dabbled in many academic and scientific pursuits for a while. Uh, but then... It turns out that Binet knew Joseph Babinski, the person, one of these people in our picture here. Uh, they were actually friends from, uh, they were old schoolmates that go way back. And at one point, uh, Babinski introduced Binet to Charles Ferre, uh, another person in our picture there. And then Ferre introduced uh, Binet to uh, Charcot. And eventually, Binet and Ferre start working together at La Sautpetriere, under Charcot's supervision. So Binet and Ferre begin working together, and they're especially interested in the effects of magnets on hypnotism. Now recall that hypnotism was often associated with magnets. We talked about how Mesmer had his theory of animal magnetism, and how hypnotism was sometimes called getting magnetized. So. Binet and Ferre, they discovered an amazing thing about magnets. They discovered that a magnet could move hypnotic suggestions from one part of the body to another. For example, if they hypnotize a woman and give her a hypnotic suggestion that her right hand is paralyzed, they could then move that paralysis from her right hand to other parts of her body using a magnet. Also, if they gave her a, a hypnotic suggestion to experience an emotion, a magnet could be used to change the emotion into an opposite emotion. And they called this phenomena magnetic transfer. And they published a major article on their findings. And the picture on the screen is a picture of a woman demonstrating this magnetic transfer. Now, this brings us back to that serious flaw in the research strategy that was used at Saltpetriere, because 
recall that the women there, they knew what the researchers wanted to see, and they actually gained status by giving the correct performances when they were hypnotized. So what happened is this. Researchers at other institutions tried to replicate Binet's findings, and they were unable to do so. So now initially, Binet simply accused these other researchers of being bad hypnotists. Uh, and this response illustrates a type of circular reasoning. They're saying, oh, well, if a study finds magnetic transfer, it supports our theory. But if a study fails to find magnetic transfer, it just means the researchers are bad hypnotists. And this is a circular type of reasoning because there's no way that an outcome could refute or disprove the theory. The outcome would support the theory either way. And we will see several examples of academics and researchers using this type of circular reasoning around this time in history. And it illustrates, uh, it illustrates the thing I talked about previously, that people have this natural inclination to notice things that are consistent with our beliefs and to ignore things that contradict our beliefs. Now, eventually, this issue will be addressed as the scientific method develops and becomes clearer over time. And eventually, an important component of the scientific method will be that, that a hypothesis must be testable. In other words, if someone proposes a hypothesis, the scientific method requires that there must be some type of outcome that would refute or disprove the hypothesis. If a hypothesis cannot be refuted or disproved in any way, then it's not a scientific hypothesis. Now, as it turned out, Binet actually eventually came to realize his error. A magnetic transfer only worked when the woman knew what the researcher was expecting to see. And in 1891, he conceded that his studies, uh, he conceded that his studies had presented uh, a quote, a host of causes of error. And one of the principal causes of unceasing error is the suggestion, is suggestion. That is the influence of the operator by his words, gestures, attitudes, and even silences. So eventually, Binet realized uh, the mistake in his research approach. Now, who is that other famous person who was studying with Charcot around this time? The person that everyone is sure to know. Well, that's the person depicted here, and this is Sigmund Freud. So here we have a picture of Freud in 1885, around the time he was studying with Charcot. So now Freud, he was, uh, he was born in Freiburg, Morovia, and he was raised in Vienna. And the map on the screen shows you where these places are. They're, they're located in Austria, the country just south of Prussia. And Freud, he grew up in a Jewish family, and he probably frequently experienced anti-Semitism throughout his life. Uh, when he was older, he described himself as a Jewish person who did not believe in God. Uh, Freud's father uh, was Jacob Freud, uh, and he was a wool merchant. And his mother uh, was Jacob Freud's third wife. And I believe there was a fairly large age difference between his father and his mother. And on the screen, you see on the right a picture of a very young Freud and his father. So Freud grows up and then he goes to the University of Vienna where he studies medicine. And while there, he spends several years working in the research lab of Ernst Brucke. Now recall, we talked about Brucke before. Previously, he was a member of that club called the Berlin Physical Society that was interested in the nervous system that group that opposed dualism and believed that sensation and perception is determined by physiological processes. So what was Freud doing in Bruca's lab? Well, interestingly, uh, Freud was involved in studying eel gonads and also looking at crayfish nerve cells. And while there, he did a lot of work staining nerve cells. And he actually spent several years working in Bruca's lab but finally, in 1881, he graduates from the University of Vienna. And the picture on the screen is Freud at age 26 in 1882. So that would be just one year 
after he graduated. So after graduating, Freud began working at a hospital and he developed a friendship with a distinguished neurologist named Joseph Breuer. And Breuer began treating a patient diagnosed with hysteria named Bertha Pappenheim. And later, Breuer and Freud would write a book together called Studies of Hysteria. And the book would be all about the treatment of Bertha Pappenheim, who was called Anna O in the book. And the book would be somewhat of a first step in launching Freud toward becoming famous for his theory of psychoanalysis. But that's a bit later in our story. Now, the story of Bertha Pappenheim, or Anna O, oh, is that she, she spent several months providing care to her dying father. And then after her father died, she experienced several symptoms that were diagnosed as hysteria. This included episodes of mutism and paralysis and deafness and depression, and maybe some delusions. Now, Breuer's technique was that he encouraged Anna O oh to recall and talk about the origins of her symptoms. And he called this catharsis or the talking cure. And he also called it chimney sweeping. Uh, notably, uh, Breuer met with Anna O oh almost daily, sometimes for several hours, over the course of more than a year. And the story is that eventually Breuer's wife complained about this and Breuer ended the treatment. Now, I mentioned that Breuer and Freud would eventually publish a book on the treatment of Anna O, oh, and that book would be a relatively successful publication. However, at this point in his life, Freud published several papers that would turn out to be much more of an embarrassment. Specifically, he published six papers on the benefits of cocaine. Now, at this point, cocaine was a new drug and Freud discovered that it had many wonderful effects and he apparently used it and he recommended it to his patients and he even recommended it to his fiance. However, it soon became apparent that cocaine also had a negative side and it was highly addictive. And so in 1885, Freud was censured by the medical community for his advocacy of cocaine. Now, Freud appears to have then dropped his interest in cocaine. However, he did have a lifelong dependency on nicotine. Uh, he was a heavy cigar smoker, and he remained a heavy cigar smoker until the end of his life when he developed an oral cancer that was likely caused by his cigar smoking. So that brings us to the point in our story where we can discuss Freud's experience with Charcot. What happened is this. In 1885, Freud won a competitive grant to go to Paris to study with Charcot for a year. Now, Freud was probably one of many students studying with, with Charcot at the time. And I don't know if Freud is someone Charcot would have remembered. But anyway, there's a famous story of an event with Charcot that would have a profound influence on Freud. Now recall that Charcot was a member of the elite class of Paris and he liked to throw lavish parties. And so the story is that a Freud, he, a Freud attended one of these parties and he overheard Charcot talking about a particular case at Salpetriere, a case of a woman who was diagnosed with hysteria. And in talking about the case, Charcot said, Ah, but in such cases, it is always a matter of sex. Always, 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 always. And the story is that Freud heard this and was impressed by it. And it would become a key idea in the later formation of his psychodynamic theory. Building on this idea, Freud would later go on to propose ideas about sexual stages of development and sexual causes of symptoms. So that is the story of Freud and Charcot. And finally, after Freud returns from his studies with Charcot, he marries his fiancée, Martha Bernays. They get married in 1886. 
And so to close out our discussion of the decade of 1880, here are pictures of Freud and Martha at the time of their wedding. 